seminar and Dr. Elham Rami is presenting today. Elham is one of our faculty members who actually holds two PhDs because one isn't enough. Um, she <laughs> yeah, she um, is a biostatistician and a pharmacoepidemiologist uh, with extensive experience, very, very well published and has been critical to my career development, let alone every, many other people, so I'll pass it to Elham. Thanks, Kaviri, for the nice introduction. It's my pleasure to present to you because uh, many of you know my work, but some don't. So it's uh, it's a nice opportunity and a pleasure to present here at CORE first year. So um, okay, so today we're presenting about misclassification in administrative database. Many of you are familiar with administrative databases, and some are not. So we're going to go slow. And uh, if you have questions, please stop me. So don't wait until the end. Uh, please stop anytime you want and any question that you uh, like. So this is mostly the work of GIE, who is here present. She started as a master's student, and now she's continuing as a research assistant. Uh, so it's mostly her work. If you have questions, you can ask them to GIE. So, uh, um, and the work was done uh, with uh, we were. Uh, used to do the conflict of interest stuff. So the, the we received the catalyst grants from CIHR. And we also received money from uh, Sports Support Quebec, who is paying the salary of GIE to do this essential work. And then our collaborators, so we have a group working on this project, which is UC Bray from the University of Montreal, Caberi, you all know her, Geneviève Lefebvre, and Lisa Lex from Manitoba and then it will go from Laval University. OK, so uh, I'm going to start by some background on administrative databases, but not for very long. And then I'm going to tell you what we, uh, the objective of the study is and what we did. And we we'll start with an example so we understand what we're doing. And then we go to the matter. So uh, administrative databases, we know that they're maintained for administrative purposes, not for clinical or research. So, um, uh, so they suffer from uh, missing data or miss missing information or sometimes misclassified information because some information is not mandatory in these administrative databases. For example, physician, uh, for example, the diagnostic code. This is not mandatory. So the physician don't have to write it. And sometimes they write their own code, like they have a code that they usually write. So that's, they're not very specific about it. So misclassification may occur, and if we do not, in the outcome, if we're doing a study, so we have the exposure and the outcome, it can occur in the exposure and in the outcome, and if we don't address it, it may bias the results. So in this study, like, um, I'm going to present an example and show you misclassification, and then we're going to go to the methods to address misclassification. So in this example, uh, we did a study back in 2009-2010 where we had uh, uh, patients who underwent uh, hip replacement and knee replacement in six hospitals in Quebec. So we went to these hospitals and we recruited the patients and we did chart review and we did uh, we did interview with the patient. And our interest was the risk of uh, uh, DTE, which is venous thromboembolism, because these patients, they, they're undergoing major surgery and they're at risk of DTE. So our interest was what's the risk in hospital and mainly, mainly what's the risk when they leave the hospital because it's not known how long they should take the anticoagulant after they leave. In hospital, almost everybody was taking it except those who have uh, side effects or something. But when they leave the hospital, it wasn't known if they should take it for 10 days, 30 days, or more. So that was our interest was to see if those who take it longer, they have less risk, and so on. But that's the third, the third part of the project that we didn't get into yet. And the anticoagulant have changed <laughs> along the way. But this part was, so we started with feasibility. This part was for validation of the VTE diagnosis. So it was important for us to validate before we go on, so that part. So we um, we recruited the patients, and then we uh, requested data from RAMQ, 
We requested the data uh, because I wanted to do a step forward, so we requested the data on everybody who did hip replacement and knee replacement. I thought the <laughs> I thought the VTE code would be perfect, and then we'll do the bigger study without having to request data again. But so we requested on the whole population, and then uh, who was in these six hospitals, we just matched them to see if their code matches. So, uh, so yeah, so, okay, go on. So these are the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the patient characteristics of the whole sample, like everybody at the RAM, from the RAMQ or everybody in Quebec who did uh, total hip and total knee replacement. It's not a full comparison, but we can see that there are some differences. And I call chart review the patients who agreed to participate in our study. Uh, so the number in our hospital was about 2,000, and the total number was 17,000. The, the, the whole population was a little bit older, and we know because we, uh, when you go to recruit a patient, if they're very old, they could be, you know, after anesthesia, they could be a little bit out of it, and they can't answer, and they don't want to participate. And some older patients also, sometimes they have, uh, they have emergent surgery, not elective surgery, so they, they fall, they break their head, and then they give them surgery. What we had are elective because we had the list from the hospital. They were writing the names on some wall before the surgery, like tomorrow such and such will have surgery. So we, we go and, and ask them. But those who are immersion, they could be anywhere in, in any world, and we don't know, and we probably don't, did not capture them. This is the sixth hospital in Montreal. Yeah, MGA. Yeah, in Montreal because it was convenient, but uh, but we we selected community Jean Talon and Verdun and uh, Saint Mary MGH Jewish and Sacré Cœur. So we have teaching hospitals and community hospitals, and then for the comorbidities because they're a little bit older, they would have a little bit more comorbidities. But you know, my presentation is not about the clinical or outcomes. But it's just to show you, like, the discrepancy and uh, so on. We will have to publish this data sometime, so we will work on it. Okay, so um, when we went to the rank Q, we, we took the primary, and so the, those who are familiar, we have the rank Q has physician billing, they have demographics, they have medication, and they have hospital. Uh, so now they have the hospital code. It used to be called medical, but it's at the rank Q. So uh, uh, medical has primary and secondary diagnoses, discharge, uh, discharge or abstract summary. So we have a clerk here who does the abstract uh, from the chart. And uh, so we took the primary and secondary. They could have up to 15, but usually you can find two or three or four, but not more, up to 15 secondary. So we found 513 VTE cases in uh, the RAMQ, in the whole sample, and, and in our hospital we found 75. From the chart review we found 81, which, you know, at first look it looks pretty good, 75 versus 81, so RAMQ missed 6, which is like not so bad, right? No. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you mean you mean same people who had the VTE, or you mean same people who... Uh, no, it's not. So <laughs> that's why you know it took us so long. To, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what we uh, because we needed to have an exposure variable. So we thought let's compare community to uh, to uh, tertiary hospitals or university hospitals. So at the un at the community hospitals where uh, Verdun and uh, and Jean Talon, we had 52 cases, and in the University Hospital, we had 29 cases. So the risk were rank Q uh, 3.7, that's the whole population, and the chart review 4.4, 2.7 versus 3.5. So, um, no, 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 we approach everybody who, could, who we could approach. Like in some cases, some people, you know, refuse participation. Some people we could not approach because they didn't have the capacity to respond because of anesthesia and stuff. 
And uh, in some hospitals, they were doing other studies. So, for example, at the Jewish, our collaborator asked us, she was doing a study, so she asked us to come second. Like, she would approach the patient first to participate in her study, then we would approach the patient. So the patient sometimes, you know, they're sitting there and they would they wanted to chat. So sometimes they didn't refuse, but but other may refuse. Like, but uh, but participation was pretty good, and we may miss also because we went to one ward, you know, with this list. But they may have been in other wards for some other reasons. I don't know. So uh, uh, so we tried to to recruit everybody. This year. Same. But participation was 62%. If we compare to rank U, not if we compare to those who refused. So because some we didn't approach at all because we didn't know about them. But if we compare to what rank U gave us for the six hospitals during that same period, uh, it was 62%. And I'm excluding MGH because at MGH we had a problem with one of the surgeons. He didn't want his patients to participate because we had not asked him to participate on the grant when we submitted. And we had like two other surgeons on the grant. So, but he didn't want, so we didn't want to clash. And so we didn't recruit his patients. We recruited other patients. So that is an issue too. Right? That's an issue. Uh, the ethics said that these are not his patients. You can approach them, but we didn't want to do that. I just well, not a big problem because you have the characteristics of those who participate and those who didn't participate. See, we have those who didn't participate from Bank Q. We do have that. So it's not like we lost them completely. We, not, we know nothing about them. And then we have some of them who did uh, who did uh, immersion surgery, not elective surgery. So. Uh, uh, from the list of the rank Q in the six hospitals, 17,000 is everybody in Quebec, right? In the six hospitals, we had, yeah, in Quebec. In the six hospitals, we had, let's say, about 4,000, and then we recruited 2,100 something. But, you know, among, we have not, we have not yet, like, uh, selected all the reasons and who, would be eligible for the study and not. But this, these are like total numbers. Okay, so. Uh, all, all comers, all those who have the code for total hip and total knee replacement. For all the Quebec. For all the Quebec. Yeah, yeah. In the, in the, in the, from the date we started uh, recruiting to the last date of recruitment. Okay, so uh, here we go. Like, if we go to the chart review among the 2,000 patients, and we're dividing that into community and tertiary hospitals. So in the community hospitals, at 1,476. If we go to the chart review, we have 52 who had VTE, and these did not have VTE. But if we look at the rank Q, you know, the yes, we have 51, so 51 and 52, the total is perfect, but we can see like the mismatch here, you know. So we have 27 who were concordant in both, 24, you know, yes in rank Q and no in the chart review, and then the reverse. So we have the same number of discordant, 0, 1 or 1, 0. So, uh, so the, the sensitivity was about 52% in the community hospitals. And the specificity was 98%, while in the um, university hospital, sensitivity was much better. Of course, the numbers are small, so A does not look too discrepant, but because we have small numbers, we have 21 concordant and then 8 and 3 that are discordant. So the sensitivity was better in the tertiary hospital, 72%, and the specificity was uh, about the same, 99%. So. So, okay, so now we have an outcome that is VTE, but this outcome is misclassified and it's largely misclassified. Like there is a, the, the sensitivity is bad and the specificity, it brings the false, uh, the false positives. So the number of false positives is about the same as the number of two positives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So, uh, so there are there are methods to adjust for outcome misclassification and studies. Oh, uh, the the out the exposure misclassification have been studied a lot, like, and there are methods to address it. But outcome misclassification is less studied because it's more cumbersome to, to do it. Uh, but in logistic regression, when the outcome is dichotomous, it has been addressed, and there are several methods. So today we're going to look at the multiple imputation method and the Bayesian method. Now, the interest was we did we did we did some comparison between multiple we did, we did look at multiple imputation and validate before. When you have uh, this is called internal validation. When you have a sample, and then you have a subsample of that sample, and your subsample you can consider it as a gold standard. Of course, here it's not a gold standard, but this is what we're supposing. Then you can impute these values to the bigger sample. And then you can reanalyze based on the imputed values. So uh, this is called internal validation, but you have to have a subsample of your sample. Now, external validation is when you you do not have a subsample, but you don't you know the sensitivity. I know that the sensitivity is 52%, and the specificity is 99%. So can I incorporate? Can I adjust for sensitivity and specificity of the outcome? in the data and see how the results change. So that's external. Now, the advantage of external is like, the internal, you need more money, you need three years or four years to recruit your patients, and it's a huge undertaking. And by the time you finish, you it's, it's seven years later, <laughs> and your validation, you know, like, I don't know what it, it's worth, and then the, the medication has changed, the treatment has changed, and so on and so forth. So the external is quick and easy, but does it work? That's that's our the goal of our uh, our study here is to see if the external works. And of course, if we use the Bayesian method, we can do the external adjustment. We could do it for logistic regression. Our aim is to do it for uh, Cox regression, but we we couldn't get that going yet. But for logistic regression, we did, and then we're finishing the paper and submitting it in December. So is to compare performance of uh, multiple imputation based on internal validation. So using the same sample, we use a Bayesian method. And external validation when we forget about the internal sample and then we take just sensitivity and specificity and see what happens. So to compare this, we did simulation with GIE. Yeah, yeah, well, we, we we tried like several different options because we did simulation, right? You know, we know the sensitivity specificity, so we tried when the sensitivity specificity are known, or when we have deviation from so from the true sensitivity specificity, because that's that's a big problem, and we will see how the results will deviate if we put in the wrong sensitivity and specificity even if the deviation is just like uh, small. Uh, so uh, so that's the thing. You know, you know, we did this study, the sensitivity is 52% and the specificity is so on, so on percent, and we have the confidence interval. But we don't know in other settings if we, we have the same sensitivity specificity. But, that, but so that's why we did the simulation. And then we applied it to the sample. So you never know in the sample if your correction is correcting or or deviating more, but uh, from the simulation, you have an idea of what you're doing. And uh, and also, like, this sheds some, uh, not doubt, but, like, people are so sure of their result that they want to change policy and want to change their practice and everything. But then when you when you know that your outcome is misclassified, I mean, you, you just have to work a little bit your sensitivity analysis and see how the result will change. If your results are, are changing by a lot, then this is not a practice change. I mean, wait for another study or accumulate more information and stuff. So it's important, even if, you, if your adjustment does not adjust properly. So. Okay, so uh, that's the application. Okay, so the multiple imputation, you know, we all know what it does. You have you, uh, so you have your subsample, you consider your subsample as the gold standard, and you 
consider the rest of it as missing values, and then you impute, and then you do five. They, it's 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 automatic now in SAS. Like it does five replications, and with MI analyze, it combines the five replications. So it's built in SAS. And it's nice. And, and you know, one of the options in the multiple imputation is the Bayesian uh, imputation. So it does use Bayesian stuff incorporated there. So we did this multiple imputation. And it has been validated for outcome and for exposure. But because it has been validated, so we tried it here and compared to the external. Now, the Bayesian method, for those of you who are not familiar with Bayesian. Bayesian is a different school like of statistics. It, uh, it considers the parameter as a variable or as a have a distribution. So it combines the prior information on the parameter, which is here our odds ratio, beta, like the estimate, and then exposure of that. So it, you have a prior information on that. And then you have your data. The, you write down the, the likelihood. You multiply them, and then you get your posterior. And then based on the posterior uh, distribution, you do your inference. And usually the posterior, we don't get it in a closed form, but we can sample from it. So we get samples, large samples, and then we, uh, we estimate the parameters from there. Uh, so that, that's the Bayesian framework in general. So for our simulation, uh, so for for the simulation, uh, for the internal uh, simulation, you know, okay. So we need we need to simulate data. What are we simulating? We have a sample and we have a subsample. So the subsample needs to be representative of the uh, those who agree to participate, like um, you know, like the percent of people who usually agree to participate. If you have a survey, it will be 20 percent, 30 percent, now 10 percent. Here we had like 62%, 50%. So you, you need to simulate something that is like more close to what you see in practice. So you need to see that. Now, in, the, in your simulation, uh, the, you, ha you have people who are exposed and people who are not exposed. So if you're talking about the drug, 1% is exposed, 15% is exposed. So you need to simulate that as well. And the, your result will depend on that. So if you simulate 1% of exposed and the event, the risk is 3%, then you end up with one, one case at the end, or, you know, you, so th this is important. So you need to, to know that exposure and outcome frequencies, what is the outcome? Is it 3% or 3 in 10,000 or 3 in 100,000? And then uh, the degree of misclassification, which is the sensitivity and the specificity. So how much misclassification? Is it the same in, in both exposed and non-exposed? Or it's differential, so you can do both. So you could do sensitivity. Here we saw that it's differential. Like in, in, in the uh, university hospitals, it's different from uh, community hospitals. Um, and there are some assumptions. So you, we are assuming that uh, we have a gold standard, of course. The true outcome status is known for subjects in the validation subsample and s missing for the rest. So missingness is at random. It's not missing because of, uh, for example, the person who did not participate, they didn't participate because they already had a VTE, or they participated because they had a VTE and they wanted to participate. So it has to be missing at random for the multiple imputation to, uh, to work. And then for our simulation, we assumed no confounding from other variables, just to make it simple. But you can, you can put other variables, so it's not a big deal to like, uh, simulate with different uh, with the confounders. I mean, I ask Jay if it's a big deal, but I <laughs> we've seen it. We've seen it in the literature. So, uh, and then in the model, you just, you, you model the true state. So the, if you're diseased, you know, this is Bernoulli, so we know that. And the, that's the form of the model. I'm not going to bother you with that. But you don't see the true state. You see the, what you see, the observed state, which is the I star. So you try to put in the sensitivity and the specificity incorporated in it. Zero. So the model exposure, we assumed no misclassification in the exposure. I mean, for, for that exposure that we have 
tertiary and uh, it's uh, it's good <laughs> but usually if you have medication or something it could also be misclassified um, okay so once we have uh, uh, for multiple imputation you do five imputation with SAS MI analyzed you combine and then for the Bayesian you know, if the disease is equal to zero, then the status would be one minus the probability of observing uh, someone who is diseased would be one minus the specificity, and that's the model, or the sensitivity, and that's the model. I mean, this is, these are the mathematical forms, and uh, and uh, this is what we put in, and. And then for the external, uh, the sensitivity and the specificity are not modeled in the data because we don't know that, but we will have a prior on them uh, to either a point or a distribution on the sensitivity and specificity. Anyways, so, and what do we look for? Um, Oh, this is, I didn't do that, but I don't know how it did it by itself. So if I wanted to do it myself, <laughs> I don't know how. Uh, okay, so at the end, we compare because we started with a true odds ratio. And then we have, after all of that, we have the odds ratio that is coming from the different methods. So when we subtract both, we call that bias. The truth minus the, the, that estimated. So we calculate the bias. Um, okay, so we compare the odds ratio, and so we did the logistic regression, 10,000 iteration, 4,000, okay. And then, um, um, what, do we do? what do we do? Okay, so you, uh, it's not here. So we do the bias, and yeah, it's here. I think I, I missed it, but the uh, bias is the difference between the two. We do the mean square error, so it's like the variance. So it's the square of the bias plus the variance from the data. And we do the coverage. So we, we calculate the 95% confidence into the, on our result. And we see if it captures the truth. And we calculate how often it captures the truth. So does it capture it 95% of the time? Or not? So these are our measure of uh, good performance of the, of the method. Okay, so we go back to see what I missed. So this is for logistic regression, and we adjust it for age, sex, duration, and so on. Um, okay, and these are the, okay. Good. Okay, so if we uh, apply that to our uh, sample, then if we take the adjusted, you know, if we compare the crude, uh, university versus uh, community, we see that there is a 35%, 36% increase in this of VTE in the university hospitals versus community, and adjusted is not very much different. In our chart review, it's 26% higher, and, and the adjusted was you know closer to the adjusted here, but we lose power because we have a much smaller sample. Uh, and uh, so if we do the multiple imputation, the risk is 1.45, you know, compared to that. But also we lost a little bit because we we are introducing more variance. So uh, we lost some power here. It's fine. The Bayesian internal gave an answer that is similar to the multiple imputation, and it should because it's based on the on the uh, subsample. But the Bayesian external, you know, based on the sensitivity and specificity that we use, uh, I'm, uh, here I'm comparing the crude, I'm sorry. So if we compare the adjusted, you know, like we have some similarities here. That's the multiple imputation. That's the Bayesian internal, that's the Bayesian external. What we used for the external here is the sensitivity and specificity that we found in the internal. So we, it's kind of cheating because usually you don't have that. But we use the sensitivity and specificity, the 52% and the 99% that we found in the subsample. We use them here. So the external work as the internal. But the external, like I'm going to show you with the simulation. For the external, um, you need to include informative priors. So we have, you need to include tight intervals. If you have large intervals, you have large variation, and so on. So this is just applying the methods to, to this. I could, 
Yeah. They would be like, I'll show you that. Yeah. I will show you in, in the simulation how they could vary a lot. Like with the internal, uh, you do not need to put informative prior because you already have the data. So you put an informative priors and you have the data, so it will, uh, it will adjust for that. And, but for the external, you need to put informative priors. Otherwise, you know, it's too wide. And um, So we'll, we will see that in the simulation. Because in the external, uh, in the internal, you you're modeling the sensitivity and specificity from the data, right? And you're using so when you model, you already have beta zero, beta one, beta two, and so on and so forth. So you yeah, and you have a prior on each one of them. So you're modeling sensitivity specificity. While for the external, you're assuming that this sensitivity is exactly what you found there, and so you're taking 52% and you're taking the interval. So you're introducing less uh, less uh, variation. But this is in our cheated uh, a little bit example. But if you if you do the simulation, you don't do that. So you you look at if you know what is, what is sensible to uh, to use. It's not artificial, but this is based on knowing to a certain degree your sensitivity. In the external, you only need sensitivity specificity. So you have to have a variable that you're including. And if you have enough information on these, uh, then you get, you know, what you get. But in the internal, although the external was based on that, but it was based on the result. So the internal, it does modeling. It's modeling the sensitivity, like, like here. Uh, but couldn't you just treat your internal subsample all the external? And then pretend there's no variance. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but there, is, there is much more to this. So with the internal, we're doing this. So if the person is not diseased, then the, observ the observed, if the observed is diseased, then the, the distribution will be 1 minus specificity. It will be modeled. And the sensitivity is modeled. So here you have variables that are introduced, and each one of them has variance. So it's incorporating more variance in the uh, in the. My question relates to the multiple implication. Is it multiple implication of for what? For the outcome. The outcome. VTE. Is it in the sample or in the whole? No, uh, like we have we have the RAMQ sample. Let's say. Is the yeah, we have the RAMQ sample and it has VTE, but we know that VTE is misclassified. Now we have in a subsample in 2,000 people we have the misclassified and the well classified. So we consider this as a gold standard. And we model this the, 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 based on the observed and the other variables. And then we impute for the rest of them. We impute for those of the 15,000, 15, we impute the truth. OK? Because they had the observed, they didn't have the truth. Now we're imputing the truth based on the model that we find. Yeah, we, uh, we introduced the code. In the simulation, we didn't have covariates because it's it's longer to uh, to run. But uh, in the model, yeah, we do have the covariates. Is there a limit on average, uh, a lower limit on percentage for which you can Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we that's in the simulation. Like, uh, how many people? Uh, what's the percent of people who participated? So you're imputing for how many? If this is 10%, for example, of the whole sample, well, we, we see we see how the result, what is the bias, and you know, like because the three criteria are bias, mean square error, and uh, coverage. And you decide for yourself if uh, it's worthwhile imputing or it's worthwhile correcting, or you'll be introducing more uh, deviation than with what you already have. So. Uh, I mean, this is just an example, but uh, so it all depends on really your setting.
So, you know, I anticipated giving you the result of the, sample, of the study before doing the simulation, but in the simulation we see how, like, the, the things will change. And we didn't simulate everything, that's for sure, because you need a lot of time. But we simulated something that is close to what we found. Like, the baseline odds is 3%. This is about what we found in the, in the odds for the, in the hospitals. The sensitivity confidence interval went from 36%, uh, I think, to 90%. So simulated sensitivity, uh, 30, 60, and 90. You could do more if you have the time. And, uh, and specificity, we did 90%, while we had, I think, 99%. So we also did 99 at some point. But for, for that, we fixed it at 90%. I think that was the lower, uh, no, the lower end was 97. So, uh, anyway, so that's 90%. And then the exposure rate, 25%. Participation rate, we simulated between 10% and 30%. In our, uh, uh, well, in our sample, I can say that it's 62% because it's 62% if I compare to the people who are in the six hospital. But if I wanted to compare to the whole Quebec population, I have 2,000 from, from 18,000. So, so it, could be, uh, it could be about 10% uh, or, or 30% or like in that range. Okay, so the, these are the criteria coverage and so on. And the participation rate higher than the exposure rate, by the way. Yeah, the exposure is how many are in tertiary and how many are in, uh, in community. That's exposed here. Uh, exposed uh, could be how many take the medication, how many don't take the medication. But participating is if you're willing to include. Uh, like it's, you have a big sample, you have a small sample. We're calling it participation, but it could be like how many, how, what is your gold standard and on how many people. <coughs> okay, go on. Okay, so this is the bias using multiple implantation, Bayesian internal, and Bayesian external. So if we started the sensitivity of 30%, and then 60%, and then 90%. So the naive sample, they gave us a bias in, um, uh, bias in the odds ratio of about 0.5, which is pretty large, right? So... You know, the validation sample, you know, almost no bias because that's the gold standard. And then a multiple imputation, so about the same as the validation sample, so the, the bias was very small. The Bayesian, you know, a little bit 0 0.04, but acceptable. The external gave 0 0.38, and that with that sensitivity of 30% and specificity of 90%. Um, what did we put on the, well, we, we, I will show you later, like, what, when we put a large range for the, sensi for the prior on the sensitivity specificity or a narrow range. With a narrow range, you get a better result. Uh, but if you have a narrow range on the wrong numbers, you get a worse result, that's for sure. But, uh, so this is with uh, about, I think, uh, yes, Jai, with uh, the first result is about what we found in the internal rate, in the range of the sensitivity and specificity for the prior. Yeah. So, uh, so it gave a bias that is better than the naive. The naive is like when you just analyze your data without any correction. Okay, so it's, it's still a little bit better. But of course, when you have a uh, when you have an internal sample, it was much better. Now, if the sensitivity is higher, then the external is working pretty well, and with sensible sensitivity specificity. But it depends. It it's, it was really sensitive to the um, sensitivity, and if the sensitivity is 0.9, then you know, like from 0.6 on. It was working pretty well, but if you have a sensitivity less than 60%, then the external uh, method was not working. The bias was large. Still better than the naive, but it was large. Um, okay, so, and the internal and the other side. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we did we did uh, some simulation for higher. We we did uh, we did a graph to show how it changes with sensitivity and how it changes with specificity. So it wasn't very uh, sensitive, I think, to the specificity, but uh, very sensitive to the sensitivity. Let me see. Let me see. Maybe I <laughs> let's see the graphs first before I. Uh, Okay, so the mean square error depends, of course, for the Bayesian, you're, in, you're introducing, you know, more variance. So you're going to see uh, la larger variances than the multiple imputation. Um, but the external here, you know, with high sensitivity, so the mean square error was not, uh, was, was okay. And... Um, but in general, you know, we know that the mean square error would be larger for the Bayesian uh, uh, method, and it all depends on what prior you put. In. And we have the sensitivity, the specificity, and the prevalence to uh, to address there. And for the coverage, you know, all of them worked well, and the coverage for the external was uh, 95, 96, and 99 percent. So the coverage was pretty good. Uh, going from 88%, you know, in this case, to 99%. In total. So coverage was good. Mean square error depended on uh, on the on the sensitivity and the specificity, but it was uh, but the by but the Bayesian external method, which is our method of interest here, works well when the sensitivity, you know, is like from 0.6 only. In, in our case, of course. So this is for differential uh, sensitivity. So we have we have in the hospital, in the tertiary hospital, a sensitivity that is different from that in the community hospital. So the exposed have higher sensitivity than the non-exposed in all the cases. So we took high sensitivity here. And the specificity was still fixed at 0.9. The odds ratio 1.5. So the external, we see that you know the external method for in terms of bias was working pretty well, and this is the bias for the naive method. So uh, and in in some cases, I mean, we can't say that it's better than the the, the, the Bayesian internal method because because we had put like some strong prior information, on. while in the internal method you don't need to do that. Okay, MSE, you know, as expected, uh, we see what we expect to see, and the coverage was uh, was very good, like 100% for the X. Uh, which one? MSE? These? This is the sensitivity in the exposed, and this is the sensitivity in the non-exposed. In the first simulation, we assume that it's the same sensitivity, non-differential. Here it's differential. Yeah, different sensitivity. So the misclassification is not the same in your exposed and non-exposed. And, and when you say exposed, exposed. exposed where we, here we're comparing uh, university hospitals versus community. So exposed will be university hospitals. So it's not exposed, you're looking at what? No, 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 no. We didn't look at medication here because it would be too cumbersome, like when and why and who. And no, no. Ex our exposure was simple. Like, are you in this hospital? Uh, this type of hospital is the hospital type, which is no misclassification. Because if you look at the other, we may misclassify some. Yeah. You know, as I said, our interest was not finding the risk of UTE. Our interest was illustrating how. Uh, you, uh, should you correct for misclassification or not? Are you introducing more bias and not? No. But it looks like there's less bias in the different sensitivities than in the one sensitivity. Yes, we, we, when we, when we uh, looked at, I'm going to show you the graph. When we looked at um, Two sensitivities, we took high sensitivities. We didn't take 0.3. We took 0.7 because we established that 1.3 was not good from the start. So if the sensitivity is low, like 30%, less than 50%, uh, 
don't e like the external would not work well. There is, it may be if you have, if you have very good information on sensitivity specificity, it may reduce the bias, but not by that much. Okay. So, but if the sensitivity is sensible, like around 60% at least, then then it works. The the, the bias is much lower. And uh, this is not a crummy hospital. It's like maybe the clerk who sends the data to medical is crummy, doesn't know. Because the person here at the uh, MUHC who is responsible to send the data, you know, every hospital, like at, uh, every month, take the data, send it to rank you. So this is like administrative here. We have a person responsible. So she's very, very experienced. And she takes the chart and, you know, she looks in the chart. But an inexperienced or a new person, you know, like sometimes they misclassify, they write a VTE if they're sending for a test or doing something. So anyway, so like it takes experience to send the data. So these are uh, outcomes that are misclassified, but like for my father infarction, for other outcomes, it, uh, they're, they're much better. It, so it all depends on what you want to look for. And this is with, uh, if you look at the primary diagnoses, uh, they were almost perfect match. So if, if it's a principal diagnosis, but if you look at the secondary diagnosis, so sometimes she doesn't choose to put it in. So she puts the more serious stuff in and she doesn't put this one in because it's not as important. Or at the end, maybe they, they had some more complication, other complications. <laughs> No, they put the, I think the abstract summary, right? But it's not the... Uh, yeah, so the, the, I mean, we take the diagnosis from medical, but it's a clerk here, like in the hospital, who is responsible, archivist, yeah. Yeah, they're trained, they're very experienced. Like, I met the person at the MUHC, but at Jean Talon, I don't know how experienced they are, you know? Like, that, that may be the difference, but it doesn't mean that they have more VTE there or not. So <laughs> uh, it, it was the same surgeon in, uh, in uh, Sacre Coeur and Jean Talon. It's the same surgeon, Dr. Laflamme was involved. He did this with me. Uh, not all of them, but I mean, he was the responsible. So this is the graph. Like, if you ask a question, that's the bias, right? And uh, so we have the exposed, you know, the uh, the odd is 3% and then exposed is this. So we have an odds ratio that we start with. Uh, the true sensitivity, um, oh, so this, this is with respect to the event rate, okay? And that that is the bias. And the sensitivity you have, the specificity is 0. 0.99 and the sensitivity is 0. 0.7 in the exposed and 98 and 0.5 in the unexposed, so something that we uh, saw. So what we estimated the sensitivity to 0.7 and the specificity to 0.5, so exactly what we have in the simulation. We, uh, we use the same sensitivity specificity, uh, but here the estimated specificity was 0.99, and uh, so the true one, uh, Jay, you have to help me. What is this? What is this difference here? Okay. Okay. And the, uh, in unexposed, we have here 0 0.98, but we assume that we have 0 0.99. So here, I, I go back. Okay. So this is the exposed, 0 0.7, 0 0.99, and that's the truth. Okay, here we assumed in, that the sensitivity is 0 0.7 and 0.99 in the exposed, so exactly the same. But the and an exposed 0.5 exactly, but instead of 0.98 we put 0.99, so just a small deviation from the truth, right? So if the event rate, so if you only have 3% events, or the odds is very close to the risk, so I'm going to say 3%. So 3% event, so the, your corrected one is worse than your true one, than your observed one. So this is the uncorrected, this is the corrected. So if you have, you have small event rate and you miss the specificity by 1%, okay, because the specificity 
give you a large number of toys, right? Because we have 1,400 non-diseased, uh, and, you know, 1% of the 1,400, you know, it overwhelms the 3% true cases. So, so here the corrected one is worst, right? So this is the bias, and that's the bias, and that's the zero bias. So, but when you, the event rate starts, like, to be a little bit larger, like 7%, then your corrected would be less biased. So you see your corrected is getting close to the zero, while your uncorrected is, like, shifting high. Okay, so this gives you an idea of, you know, the dependence on how many true patients you have in your samples, how many true outcomes you have in your sample, and your correction will depend on that. So if you only have three people who are truly diseased and you're putting in 100 of false stuff, so you're going to have larger bias. So your correction, you know, will start correcting from, that's the external correction, of course, not the internal. So from this point on, it will be, the bias will get closer, so it has to depend on that. And so this here is when we put the specificity a little bit lower, because we usually tend to, to estimate it a little bit lower, because we think we're doing ourselves a good thing, like, okay, it's, the truth is 99%, but we assume 96 to be conservative. But so if we do that, then again, the corrected here, in, you know, is worst. This is the bias from the observed, and that's from the corrected. So until you get here, again, with the 8%, then your corrected will start being, uh, being better. And uh, but, uh, apparently it looks there that the deviation is not as large as, as here because with, uh, you know, with the lower sensitivity. So, I mean, we're still exploring these... Uh, these uh, scenarios, but uh, see it, uh, I mean, correction, there is no one answer to, so it, uh, if you want to correct, you really have to have, if you don't have an internal sample, so you have to have, you know, good information, because a small deviation in the sensitivity, if you, if you put exact same specificity, you get the perfect answer, no bias, but if you don't know the true specificity, and somebody is telling you this is 99, but you want to be conservative and you put 96, then you, you put the big deviation. Why, so. do you think Why? Because the internal will cost you three years. <laughs> like the MI is the yeah, but the MI, you need information on the gold standard to be able to impute. You need, you need an internal sample for the MI as well. External is, okay, I did this study, you know, you, you did a study on the VTE, and you know from my study that the sensitivity is 52%. So you just want to do a sensitivity analysis on what you did and see how your results will change if the data was corrected for the sensitivity. Now, if you see how the results will change, which one of the results is better or less biased? Is it your observed result or your corrected result? So your corrected result will be good if you have, you know, like some sensible proportion of people who have the disease and so on. So if you're studying a rare disease, you really need, like, perfect information. But in this case, we wouldn't have any information on the outcome, the true outcome. So you need some information because when when you have when you have missing information, because we you use the multiple, you don't. Uh, we have the observed, but we don't know which one is. We don't have the true outcome at all. So you need some information on the true outcome. So you can model it and impute for the others. For the missing data, you already have that. So to, for the missing data, you have your, but this is usually the exposure, right? So you, you have some that are there, but you have some that are missing. You impute for the missing. Here, everything will be missing. So you're giving what the MI is to on a 
Yeah, so so you have some non-missing, which are the gold standard, and you have the missing, which are the non, not there. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, does it correct or it doesn't? Like because we have seen, you know, those who of you who work in pharmacoepidemiology, we have seen some sensitivity analyses where you know it could it could shift the odds ratio to something that is really ridiculous like for new medication or for anything let's we'll say if everybody was using this then the odds ratio would be 30 percent higher or something like something really really ridiculous with some of the corrections now uh, th i think this these simulation will give us an idea of where how to interpret that and then and then just to put a grain of salt on this on the uh, assumptions that we people would put in like uh, you know when you don't have information on on something and you put in information sometimes you're biasing more than than you're helping but it all it all depends like i'm not saying here it's always wrong no here you know from here on it's better seven percent <laughs> It's not uh, like when we did the example. When we did the example, the change was not huge. So, so I, I don't, don't know, know what, what uh, which one and uh, like this, this is this is, is the uh, adjusted observed, but it's <laughs> it's. Uh, it's significant. That's the only thing, you know. And when you introduce your uh, stuff, like it becomes non-significant. So then you don't really know, you know, how how it would. But I mean, as point estimate, it's it didn't change all that much. But you're introducing more uncertainty, and then with all these uncertainty. People wait and accumulate information. That's all they do. They do. All of the methods, in fact, go below one. So all of them bring in the question. Yeah, because you have you're taking a small sample now. I think so I've really only published in the uh, my observed primary my primary sample. Your primary sample yeah, here. This is what people do. <laughs> this is what people do. <laughs> well, this is what people do. But then at the end, at the end, you have like. Then uh, let's say you have ten papers on the risk of anticoagulants, for example. One says the risk is twice as high. The other one says the risk is thirty percent lower. The third one says there is no risk. So then you look at these papers and you say, what's going on? What goes on is misclassification in your data. You know, like this is what, especially the data like RAMQ is less misclassified than other countries, because other countries they have more problems in the data than ours because people are in and out mm -hmm. and when they're out like there are periods where you don't see anything and people incorporate I mean keep that and uh, you know they have information from one source but not the other but you have some gaps and but here at least you don't have that but um, I'm sure that like in an observational study, it's better to be uh, like when you're not sure, you're not sure. It's better to be not sure than like precisely wrong <laughs> because, uh, you know, like if you follow the literature, like there have been lots of debates on especially new medications and the risk. And what's uh, what happens? Uh, yeah, yeah, they're more believable because they're uncertain. And uh, and for the first. But I think you just reported as you know, looking in my mean analysis, my primary sample is all done. These are these are the sensitivity analyses, and albeit there's yeah. some uncertainty. Yeah. All in yeah. 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 I I think the sensible idea because here we have a sample and we know what's the sensitivity and specificity. And we didn't introduce a misclassification in the exposure, but usually you do. Yeah. 
if you're taking some medication, you have mis more misclassification in the exposure. So there are more issues there. So uh, here we, with perfect setting and everything, you you get that. So it you present like your sensitivity analyses and you tell the reader what's going on, especially that you don't know how misclassified your data is. I think they know that misclassification can cause something, but uh, it's it's not. Uh, uh, yeah, there are some literature on multiple imitation at least on the external Bayesian. We haven't seen a lot of literature there, but uh, you know the Greenland method, like this is external, but uh, uh, it's more it's more for the exposure, but but uh, you know it takes precise sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is at one point specificity, so the confidence interval is like na narrow to one point. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends on uh, there are lots of different things in observation studies. So if you combine everything, I don't know what <laughs> what will be cooking in there, but like People are tackling different problems. This is one of the problems, assuming everything else is perfect. So they tackle everything else, assuming that this is good. But uh, so there are like different issues in observation studies. And in clinical trials, there may be more issues. So, so it's not only an observation. So thank you very much. <laughs> I think we have passed the one o'clock.